being here with us tonight. Um, in place of an introduction, I'd like to make four simple observations on how Cyber Zizek's work is set to function, or at least how it has affected me since I started to read his books and attend a number of his lectures and seminars a long time ago. The first observation is by my kind of commonplace about Zizek's thought in general, and that is precisely why it might prove to be a false insight after all. But I'll make it anyway. As it turns out, the truth of the situation, whether it be an ideological formation, a theoretical construct, a historical sequence, or whatever else Zizek might be describing, the truth, of the truth, that truth is almost always counterintuitive, or the opposite of what is commonly believed or accepted. With this phenomenal ability to grasp, compress, and bring out the stakes of, let's say, a belief system, or a film, both at the level of the film's narrative or at the level of its formal components, Slavoj Zizek again and again shows that by pushing the inherent logic of the formation under consideration, by daring to move things one step further, by taking the key but it's a missing step, the meaning of the entire edifice is reversed, turned upside down, not to say annihilated. The second, more uncanny observation is that Zizek's upcoming work, his next book, and he has written more than 30 to date, will quasi, quasi systematically tackle precisely the current and pressing subject when fields needs to be urgently discussed and rethought. This has been proven to me yet again with the publication of his new volume titled First as Farce, Then as Tragedy, which among other things is rumored to present a more than striking analysis of the global financial system. The third, and this is of course a more personal note, over the years I have been, become convinced that, that Zizek is able to write faster than I'm able to read him. <laughs> Last but not least, uh, this tonight is marks the official launch of like 34 on Delirium. I wanted to point out that Slagway Zizek must have contributed at least one essay to every issue of the magazine since its inception back in the fall of 1990. That, I believe, in fact, is a fact worth noting and extraordinary proof of loyalty to the publication, to its makers and, and readers. So before we start, as, and as a way to perhaps set the stage for this talk, I, I'd like to read a couple of paragraphs from the introduction of The Parallax View, published in 2006. The illusion on which the two stories rely, that of putting two incompatible phenomena on the same level, is strictly analogous to what Kant called transcendental delusion. The illusion of being able to use the same language for phenomena which are mutually untranslatable and can be grasped only in a kind of parallax view, constantly shifting, pers shifting perspective between two points between which no synthesis or mediation is possible. Thus, there is no rapport between the two levels, nor shared space, although they are closely connected, even identical in a way, they are, as it were, on the opposed side of the mobile strip. The encounter between Leninist politics and modernist art, exemplified in the fantasy of Lenin meeting Dadaist in the cabaret Voltaire in Zurich, cannot structurally take place. More radically, revolutionary politics and revolutionary art move in different temporalities. Although they are linked, they are two sides of the same phenomena, which precisely as two sides can never meet. This is more than a historical accident. And there is more than a historical accident in the fact that in matters of culture, Leninists admired great classical art, while many modernists were political conservatives, proto-fascists even. Is this not already the lesson of the link between the French Revolution and German idealism? Although they are two sides of the same historical moment, they could not directly meet. That is to say, German idealism could emerge only in the backward conditions of a Germany where no political revolution occurred. In short, the occurrence of an insurmountable parallax, parallax gap, the confrontation of two closely linked perspectives, which no, which no neutral common ground is possible. In a first approach, such a notion of parallax gap cannot, be, cannot but appear as a kind of Kantian revenge over Hegel. It's not parallax, yet another name for a fundamental antinomy which can never be dialectically mediated, sublated into a higher synthesis since there is no common language, no shared ground between the two levels. It is the wager of this book that, far from posing an irreducible obstacle to dialectics, 
the notion of parallax gap provides the key which enables us to discern its versatile form. So Slavo, thank you for uh, taking the time to come and speak to us this evening. And Josefina, it's your turn to tell us about the MNA34. Thank you.